but he did not answer her at all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As Christians, we confess the word singular, Jesus Christ our Lord, and Holy Scripture that bears him witness. Yet the Bible is made up of two testaments, each a noisy plurality of words and voices. As Christians, we also have one gospel to proclaim, good news for all throughout the earth. <coughs> and yet that gospel is attested to by four evangelists, four gospel texts, each with its own emphasis, each with its own narrative and timeline. Both comparatively and internally, we find what some might call inconsistency. For some, an embarrassment. At best, a puzzle to be worked out, reduced in pursuit of that faulty 19th century ideal, how it really was. This is to miss the point, to miss the richness of what grace has given us, seemingly divergent material to work with and indeed to live with. Constantly reconfigured by the church in combination and context, its angles form a prism, refracting the light of the uncontainable word of God into the lives we seek to lead as Christians, illuminating through these ultimately very short texts the inexhaustible mysteries of the wide world and its creator and redeemer. New Testament scholarship is, of course, essential, important and fruitful, but it is only one part of what Christians are called to do. Our faith is not essentially, nor is it meant to be, reducible to a precise set of principles based on an exact historical chronology. Let's trust God's purposes more than that. We're currently making our way through St. Matthew's Gospel, and even within this text we get different emphases. Last week Father Peter engaged us with that beautiful, comforting image of the outstretched hand of Jesus Christ across the tumult of the waves. Do not be afraid. Take the Lord's hand in your trials and embrace what he offers you through his church. This week it is, I'm afraid, love in a colder climate. We might immediately identify several thorny theological questions in this very short passage we've just heard. How are we to understand the language of demonic possession? What do we make of the scandal of particularity? And then how do we respond to the idea of a God that we call unchanging, apparently so ready to ditch his heady principles upon the insistence of this outsider? Difficult stuff. I'm sure it has nothing to do with the preaching rotor. <laughs> and then there's the awkwardness of the story. It is not fair to take the children's food and to throw it before the dogs. It's not a line you'll find emblazoned in rainbow letters in the foyer of your local church primary school. <laughs> Nor did it make it into Thomas Jefferson's dreadful redaction of the Gospels. But Jesus' rebuke is as important as that outstretched hand. It's true to say that the Greek diminutive Kunarion reads better as puppies or pets than the dogs of a Shakespearean insult, the way it's rendered in the translation we've used this morning. But St. Matthew's point certainly stands. He replaces Mark's Syrophoenician woman with the anachronistic label Canaanite, throwing his version of this story explicitly against the backdrop, the memory of Israel's Old Testament advent recording for us this morning that beautiful vision of Isaiah's. Jesus' God is the God of Israel, 
Gentile Christianity has been grafted onto the Jewish tree. And then we're made in our own discomfort at the Lord's initial treatment of that Canaanite woman to inhabit a certain vulnerability ourselves. We're thrown from a place of modern, uneasy guilt about the way majorities and the privileged treat the outsider to experience something of the outside ourselves this morning, to remember our own weakness, to be mindful of our own faulty, unreasonable expectations and our own otherness, but to be bold enough from within that mess to have the humility to ask. The encouraging, <coughs> outstretched arm of last week remains gospel truth. But this week, the gospel momentarily retracts that arm and emphasizes the parallel need for us to reach out to Jesus, to let go of our shame about having sometimes to beg, to let go of our restraint and curation about the truth and depth of our need and of the superficial ideals of self-worth that the secular world pours into that silent abyss. We are possibly quite unfashionably encouraged to accept, in a sense, to be grateful for and certainly to use generously that which we're given in all its inequality. This episode lends heroism, honor, and indeed abundance of life to making do. Not to strive always to sit at that proverbial table, nor to stand on our pride and re refuse to beg beneath it. Our prayer lives will certainly go nowhere if we don't allow ourselves to acknowledge, even paradoxically to rejoice, in these at first glance dejected states. States in which the Lord doesn't seem to be listening, when others seem to have everything, and we're often left wanting. It's tempting, especially when the gospel feels difficult, to shy away from its recognizable truth, perhaps especially when it touches a nerve. We're made to see something of how the world is in this gospel passage, made even to feel in engaging with it this morning, in our own time, some of that, and yet we're lent through it dignity. If only we will persist through Jesus's silence, we will let it reshape us as it was for the Canaanite woman. The reserve of Jesus Christ this morning, even the coolness in attending to the Canaanite woman, persistent yet not proud, is followed by abundant gift, made all the more dramatic by Matthew's rendering for Jesus' coolness in the first place. In letting go of some of what we think we deserve by reaching out our hand to him, we prime ourselves to receive from his almighty hand, yet outstretched, the even greater glory that in him we really do deserve. Amen.